Hello everyone and welcome to part two in our retaining wall series using subassembly composer. Today we'll look at a slightly more advanced option than last time. In the interest of time I decided to show a finished example and just walk through the parameters instead of typing everything in from scratch. So let's get started. We're going to take a look at this wall that you see on the screen here in the preview area. Let's look at the input parameters first. We have side as always. We have a design height which is nothing more than a value that we can key in to control the height of the wall above the footing. So from down here at the top of the footing around this point called P11 to the very top P2. That'll be our design height. Width of our footing will be from P8 to P9. You can see our uh, link 8, that'll be the width of link 8. Footing spread, which will just be the thickness of the footing, that's from P9 to P10, that distance. The batter slope, this will just be the slope on the wall here at L15, so we can control that. And the last parameter is called front face cover. This is just a value to allow us to control the cover of existing ground or the cover of our back slope over the top of the footing height. So you can see here from P11 to P12 would be this height. And from P12 moving this way is the catch slope or the targeting link that finds existing ground. Speaking of that, you can see on my target parameters, I have existing ground. I can move that up and down. And I also have a parameter for the bottom of the footing. That will be an elevation target. So if I move bottom of footing, notice how the wall changes because we actually have a profile for that as well. So we have a profile for the bottom of the footing and our horizontal and vertical profile insert location will be here at P1. And that's where we'll get started looking at the parameters for the geometry. So starting at P1, as you can see here, this is just the origin point, zero, zero. So we'll start to the next. We go delta X, delta Y. We know this value of 0.5 or six inches. So we're gonna go six inches up. And basically what we're building here is a curb top on the top of our wall. So our standard wall will just come straight over and down. But because this is going to be on the edge of a back trail at the top of the wall, so this is a special condition of this wall. So this is a known value from the plan, so we'll go to the next point. Notice here we have P2 and L2. We're creating links as we go. But this is also a known value for the curb width is 1.25 feet. And just like the part one video where we talked about start in one direction, go as far as you can, and then go the other direction, we're going to use that same rule again today, as you'll see in just a second. So this value we also know from the plans, delta X, delta Y, we go down minus 1.5 in the Y. Now, though, we're at this particular slope. We know the slope from the plans of L14 here, or this line, but we really don't know where to stop it because of this batter slope could change. It's a variable. So we're going to stop there and not continue and see if we can come back to that. Where we go from here, though, while we're in the area, I'm going to go ahead and place an auxiliary point. You can see AP1 from point one. What this represents is our typical wall height at the top, which is given from the plans as well. And this point will allow us to compute this batter slope correctly because the batter slope is based on the top of the wall down to the footing. So I didn't really have a point there, so I'm going to place a fake or an auxiliary point there for computation purposes. And you can see the delta x it's a delta X, delta Y, the delta X is an 11 and a half inches over, or 0.9583. Okay, so we leave that alone now. We go, and you see we're going completely the other direction now, because P8 is at the very bottom down here. So where does P8 originate from? Well, notice here we've got slope and delta Y from P2. P2 is the very top of the wall. So to find P8, and this is variables, we're going to use our input parameters. So for the slope, we're going to say a negative 100,000% to represent a near vertical slope. And then for the delta Y, or the distance down to P8, we're going to use our input parameters. So we're going to say go down, which is the negative, the design height of the wall, which we input here, plus the spread or the thickness of the footing. That should take us all the way down to the bottom of the footing. And so as those variables change, that P8 will reflect the correct location. So now for L8 or P8 to P9, remember that's just the width of the footing. So this will be a delta X, delta Y from P8. And notice my delta X is just equal to my input parameter W footing. So that's easy. Now I go for my 
thickness, which is just my spread, right? So I'm going to do a delta x, delta, delta y zero for the x, of course. And for the vertical, I'm going to say the spread of the footing. Just type in that input parameter. So I'm controlling this wall completely. So now while I'm here, notice kind of went in a different direction. I've stopped really at L10 because again, we've got a batter slope coming down that we have not computed yet. So we just can't place a point at P5 here from P10. It's not that easy. So instead what we do is we come back to P8, which is down here, and we're going to place a point at the location of the thickness of the footing. And we're gonna say basically go zero in the X, go up the thickness of the footing or the spread, F spread. And what we're gonna use that for are several reasons, but the main thing is we'll be able to input this parameter for the cover. Remember we talked about this front face cover? That'll give me a point to place this by. So from P11 to P12 will be the front face cover. So notice at P11, we didn't place a link as we go. You know, a lot of these have points and links. We didn't do that here. So I've had to place link 10 from P8 to P11. And remember when we came down originally all the way to P8 at the very bottom, we didn't place a link either. So we're placing these links so they will stretch with the correct point. So back to L10, so we placed a link between P8 and P11. Uh, we could have done that on the fly. So again, I don't remember why I did that, but it doesn't matter. Then on our link going up the wall, we have a link from P11 up to P1. Had to place that link because remember we went from P2 all the way down to P8. So we had to rebuild these links going back. Now we were ready to go from our AP1, which was our auxiliary point up here at the top, AP1, go down the batter slope that I'm going to key in to find AP2. So my batter slope, I need to do a negative, so it'll be the correct downward slope. And then for my location vertically, where to stop here at uh, AP2, what I basically did is subtracted the vertical or the Y position of P10. Here's P10 from P1, which is at the origin and then just put a negative so that it goes down. So what that'll mean is that will let P10 determine the location of AP2 vertically and the slope will compute how it uh, gets there basically. Okay, so AP1 down to AP2, P1 minus P10 and a negative sign and the slope because this will be a slope in delta Y is the negative batter slope. Now you may wonder why did I do a auxiliary point here? I actually don't remember. There was something interesting going on. I found when I tried to place a regular P5 here, because what you'll see the next particular point, I've got P5 and I just, I'm basically I'm renaming. I'm saying P5 follow AP2. We didn't have a link here. Remember we didn't know this position so I can come back and fill in the gaps. I do a link only L12 between P5 and P10. So we've got a link there. Now for this P4 up here, remember this is the point we didn't know. We're kind of to here now at P5, we're kind of done in this area. So I need to come back up this slope and locate P14. Well, I did that with an intersection. So if you look here, I did an intersection two point slope and we intersected the slope that I knew from the plans here, which was 100% L4 or I'm sorry, L14, intersect that with the negative or the reversal of the batter slope coming up. And you see I did a negative batter with the extend slope one and two turned on. Okay, and that located P14. I need a link now. Remember, I didn't have a link, so I place a link between P4 and P14 to close that. Now I need a link on the batter slope. So we said L15, give me a link between P14 and P5. So we close that. And now we were ready to place a shape. Okay, you can see all the links here and it's easy. You just click the button and you can select in the middle of the links and it'll create the shape for you. From that point, I created point P12 from P11. Remember we created P11, I said we we're gonna come back to this. 
So from P11, I went up front face cover. So whatever that value I can for the front face cover is where P12 will be located. Zero in the Y to go straight up. Then we have our final slope, which is a slope to surface from P12 to find existing ground surface. We went a minus five in this case, and I reversed the slope direction to go over to the left. So now at this point, we've got a packet, our PKT file, we can save and use this in Civil 3D. So I'll move over to Civil 3D just so you can see it. This is what we had. We had a profile you can see in blue here. That is the top of the wall profile. And then at the bottom, we had a bottom, bottom of footing profile. You can see it's steps. And so the plans required us to insert the various heights of wall. And so what I did is I created a subassembly or a, an assembly using our wall at the various design heights called for the plans. Now, you could actually do this with one subassembly. And I showed how to do something similar with uh, my uh, select a curve video. I guess it was earlier this year where I showed how to put the standard shapes where you just hit a pull down list and you get that height or that shape. But I didn't want to get that uh, advanced on this one. So what I did is I just placed the various design heights shown in the plans manually. So I have all these assemblies here for the various wall heights. So then my corridor will have a region for each one of those as shown in the plans. So you can see in the regions, I have various regions of various wall heights and you can see how they repeat as well. Okay, so that came right off the plans. And then what you're left with is after your model, here's my horizontal and the wall location. I'll select the corridor and go to object viewer. And I'll spin this around to the wall side. There we go. And this is really what you'll end up with with the wall. And you can see the slope on the back as well. So pardon my colors here. But that shows your step wall. And now you can make solids out of this. And in a future video, I'll show how to take this to Revit where we could reinforce this wall if needed. So the goal today was to go a little more advanced with a retaining wall, show you a few more options for creating that and sub-assembly composer. I hope this has been beneficial. Have a great day.